Good morning. Good morning. <sighs> Thank the Lord for 64 years. Amen. I'm 64 today. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. It's funny, you don't look a day over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our scripture is found in Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. Revelation 17, verse 14. It says, These shall make war with the Lamb. Speaking of the ten kings. And the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Amen. Shall we pray? Father, we're here not just as a religious exercise, but we're here because we want to commune with you. And we want to commune with one another, with your children. For you've, you've told us to gather together, and all the more as we see the day approaching. And we definitely see the day approaching, Lord. And we're here <clears throat> not, to, not to hear me speak, but to hear your word. And Lord, I pray that your word would not return to you void, but today that your word would be implanted in our hearts and that we'd be encouraged and strengthened. And I ask for those that view this video that your Holy Spirit would be with them as they consider these things and that it would help them uh, in this final battle of the great controversy. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today we are going to look at a study I've been working on for quite some time. It's called The Benchmarks of the Ecumenical Movement. Matthew 13.30 says, let both grow together until the harvest, referring to the wheat and the tares. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together, first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. So I see in this verse, Two things. First, the tares are gathered together, and then they are bound in bundles. And there is a movement in the world to gather together and to bind together. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. <clears throat> now, first of all, let me say that I am for Christian unity in the faith, in the truth, in the Spirit, in Jesus, in the Father, and in love. Amen. And it must be in all of those. The unity sought by the ecumenical movement is at the expense of truth. The faith, the Spirit, the Father, the Son, and real love. It is at the expense of the real gospel of Jesus Christ, which teaches us that there is no other name under heaven other than Jesus Christ by which we must be saved. The ecumenical movement teaches another gospel by which one may choose any one of a number of roads that all supposedly lead to heaven. 
Paul said in 2 Timothy, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own loss shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. In Galatians he says, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So we're going to take a look at uh, some historical data. And we're going to be looking at the rise of the National and International Council of Churches. <clears throat> And much of this is from Wikipedia. A watershed gathering in which many U.S. delegates participate was the World Missionary Conference in Edinburgh, Scotland in June 1910. 1,200 representatives, largely Anglo-American, assembled around the missionary theme, the evangelization of the world in this generation. After the Bible societies of the 1800s spread the Bibles throughout the world and sent missionaries throughout the world, the missionaries from these various denominations were running into each other out in the field. And quite often they were stepping on each other's toes. And so the denominations said, we need to get together and coordinate our efforts so that we're not duplicating our efforts, and so that we're not also getting in the way of each other. Okay. So that was kind of what started these meetings, uh, conciliatory meetings. And once they got together, they said, well, yeah, we would like to work together, but you know, you believe this and we believe that. And, and so they started to discuss these various issues and uh, quite often it kind of ended their meetings. Um, though Roman Catholics and Orthodox were not invited to the WMC, the meeting galvanized Protestant forces and opened the way for other ecumenical projects, even as it modeled the shape of other world councils to come across the 20th century that would be broader in scope and participation. The Federal Council of Churches of Christ in America arose out of a meeting of 29 denominational representatives at Carnegie Hall in New York in 1905 and was officially organized in 1908 in Philadelphia. The Federal Council gave voice to the ideals of the social gospel movement of the early 20th century with its stress on issues surrounding labor, social equality, urbanism, and poverty. Um, the FCC changed its name to the National Council of Churches of Christ. And um, another conciliar type agency unique to the United States was the Consultation of Church Union, the COCU, formally organized in 1962, brought together nine denominational oriented uh, toward organic reunion in a church truly Catholic, truly evangelical, truly reformed. However, the proposal lost steam by the early 1970s when member churches objected to some of the terms of the union. They couldn't quite get along, couldn't quite agree on everything. Between 1910, WMC and the First Assembly of the World Council of Churches in 1948 were several developments contributing to the WCC's founding. One such force was a 1920 encyclical published by the Eastern Orthodox Patriarch of Constantinople titled, Unto All the Churches of Christ Everywhere. The statement is unique as a call for unity and cooperation issued by one church to all other churches calling for an end to bitterness, mistrust, and proselytism, as well as beginning to extensive theological dialogue and practical cooperative witness. 
This proposed League of Churches would come to be embodied in the faith and order and life and work movements that shortly took their rise. Another proposal for a world ecumenical body came from Archbishop Nathan Soderblom of Sweden, who convened the first life and work conference in Stockholm in 1925 with the motto, Doctrine Divides, Service Unites. We've heard that several times, haven't we? Okay, so that goes clear back to 1925. Life and work sought to continue the practical form of cooperation found in earlier uh, world conferences, but with key differences. For one, there were 610 official representatives sent from a wide variety of churches, including Eastern Orthodox, Anglican, and Protestant. However, tensions arose at the meeting when German delegates balked at what they heard as a mandate to build the kingdom of God on earth in the discourse of Anglo-American delegates who spoke optimistically of the possibilities of social transformation. The German critique was reflected in the 1937 Oxford England meeting of life and work with its concerted effort to include a more theological background in the form of papers and studies presented in anticipation of the meeting by a wide variety of constituents German representatives, however, were unable to attend due to restrictions placed upon them by the Nazi government. So the Second World War got in the way of their ecumenical progress, and they had to wait until 1948, the end of the war, to actually establish uh, the World Council of Churches. So the World Council of Churches brought together Faith and Order, Life and Work, and later the International Missionary Council and the World Council of Christian Education. Uh, the 1948 WCC Assembly was held in Amsterdam, attended by representatives of 44 nationalities from 147 churches. The Roman Catholic Church declined to participate. The Council's self-understanding since 1948 has continually evolved. Roman Catholic observers are now regularly present at the meetings and are involved in the work of the WCC in ways short of official membership. This brings us up to 1950s. Negativity by the Roman Catholic Church's leadership toward Protestant communions was underscored in various papal encyclicals and Vatican pronouncements issued during the ecumenical movement's development. Pope Leo XIII's 1896 encyclical condemned Anglican orders as absolutely null and utterly void, complicating any recognition of Anglicanism's ecclesial status on the part of the Catholic Church. While church officials, including the Pope, were often kept apprised of the gatherings sponsored by Protestant and Orthodox colleagues, Pope Benedict XV, when approached by Bishop Charles Brent and others about joining faith and order in 1919, summarily expressed the church's policy. The Pope listened intently to the proposal, offered his prayers and good wishes, but followed up with a firm no to Roman Catholic participation and invited the Protestant guests to consider that the Catholic Church opened wide its arms to welcome them to the reunion. The stance was further enshrined in Pius XI's 1928 Mortalium Animos and the 1949 Vatican pronouncement De Motoin Ecumenica, which prevented Catholics from participating in ecumenical gatherings without official permission. Return to Rome was, in effect, the Catholic Church's prevailing form of ecumenical outreach prior to the Second Vatican Council, convened by Pope John XXIII and lasting from 1962 to 1965. Pope John XXIII, elected Pope in 1958, the year I was born, formed a secretariat for promoting Christian unity in 1960. 
to facilitate relationships with other Christians, a practice that would be given theological shape by the council a few years later. The new form of ecumenical commitment that sprang from this council was most evident when Protestant and Orthodox observers were invited to be present during the proceedings. The dogmatic constitution on the church set forth an ecclesiology of communion in which the church was defined as the people of God by baptism before it was identified with its clerical hierarchy. The boundaries of the church were defined in more generous terms than usual in the Council's Decree on Ecumenism, which identified the non-Catholic baptized as separated brethren who were imperfectly incorporated into the Catholic Church. Non-Catholic churches and communities, according to the dogmatic constitution and the decree, share numerous elements of sanctification and of truth with the Catholic Church, namely the written word of God, the life of grace, faith, hope, and charity, with other interior gifts of the Holy Spirit and visible elements too. The true church was described as subsisting in the Catholic Church, meaning that while the fullness of the church resides in the Catholic Church, other Christian communities have an imperfect share in the full means of salvation the Catholic Church professes itself to possess. So you don't have the full means of salvation outside of the Catholic Church. Remember that. You don't have the full means of salvation. In January 1959, Pope John XXIII called the Second Vatican Council, which produced Unitatis Reditigratio, the decree on ecumenism. That has influenced us down to the present moment. Pope John made his surprising call for a council at the close of the week of prayer for Christian unity. He had no intention other than that of fostering the good of souls and bringing the new pontificate into clear and definite correspondence with the spiritual needs of the present day. This fostering of the good of souls included reaching out to separated communities. His announcement in January 1959 struck an ecumenical theme. Pope John XXIII's announcement was a turning point in the laborious quest for Christian unity, providing an unforeseen catalyst that the Pope should be the one to take the initiative for unity among the churches and to outline the process in terms of cooperation toward creating a single flock, and no longer in terms of returning to the past, was unexpected almost to the point of being unbelievable. It provoked disparate reactions and required a complete rethinking of ecumenical strategy. Hmm. Following Vatican II, the Catholic Church has been a strong participant in long-term bilateral dialogues across the denominational spectrum and present in unofficial capacities in many international conciliar meetings such as at the WCC. The Lutheran-Roman Catholic Dialogue are a series of discussions which began in July of 1964 now, the council didn't end until 1965. So these discussions began before the council even ended, which I thought was interesting. These gatherings reflect the new openness of the Roman Catholic Church to dialogue with other Christian denominations as well as other religions. These dialogues have been primarily between church representatives of the Lutheran World Federation and the representatives of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. Since July of 1964, there have been over 50 sessions held, taking up 12 rounds of topics as of 2015. And these are the topics that they have been discussing.
The Lutheran World Federation and the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity hosted a joint ecumenical commemoration event in Lund, Sweden on October 31st, 2016. This was a shared Lutheran Roman Catholic commemoration of the 500th anniversary of the posting by Martin Luther of the 95 Thesis in 1517. So this is from the book, The Vatican-Washington-Moscow Alliance, <clears throat> written by Avro Manhattan in 1982. And he wrote, Another and more subtle weapon will be used to attack Catholicism's religious rival, Protestantism. The first offensive along the denominational front has already been launched. It is ecumenism which from its very beginning, coupled with Protestantism's leftist political bent, resulted in the enfeeblement of the major Protestant bodies. So the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity has also been engaged uh, with numerous other churches and religions in dialogues for the last 50 years. As a result of these dialogues, a number of agreements have been signed between the Vatican and various religious groups. One of the most notable agreements that have been signed is the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification, which was signed and released jointly by the Lutherans and the Catholics on October 31st, 1999. They chose October 31st because it is the date that Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis to the church door in Wittenberg. The Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification was subsequently signed by the Methodist Church in 2006 and by the Reformed Churches in April of 2017. And so here is a, an article on Vatican Radio uh, talking about the Reformed Churches signing the agreement. In April of 2017, uh, the Vatican's Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity has released a note regarding the association of the Reformed Churches to the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification, calling the occasion an important milestone. Okay. They have an agenda. And the agenda is making further growth in spiritual and ecclesial communion between the Protestant and the Catholic Churches possible. The milestone in ecumenical relations and the full visible unity of Christians, the note says, the event is not yet the end of the road, but a significant stage on the way. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the Vatican has been in dialogues with the Pentecostals since 1972. And here it talks about them concluding the dialogue on charisms. Um, and it says the fifth session of the sixth phase of the International Catholic Pentecostal Dialogue took place in Rome, Italy from the 10th to the 17th of July in 2015. So in January 2014, at the invitation of Kenneth Copeland, a priest of the Anglican offshoot group named Tony Palmer, uh, he spoke at the Kenneth Copeland Ministerial's Annual Minister's Convention. Tony Palmer was good friends with Kenneth Copeland and Pope Francis. Apparently, he was the ambassador chosen for bringing the Pentecostals into unity with the Vatican. What transpired at that convention was monumental. Here's some of what Tony Palmer said. We know that the first thousand years there was one church, it was called the Catholic Church. And the word Catholic means universal, it doesn't mean Roman. Catholic means, you, if you're born again, raise your hand if you're born again. You're a Catholic. <laughs> Take back, redeem what belongs to you. We are Catholics. <laughs> And then there was the split at the end of the first millennium. We had the Orthodox, East and West, two churches. Then 500 years later, we have Luther and his protest. Three churches in 1500 years. Three denominations, not three churches. 
And then, from Luther's protest onwards, 33,000 new denominations. I've come to understand that diversity is divine. It's division that's diabolic. Is division diabolic? Jesus said, don't think that I came to bring peace, but a sword. Okay. It's the glory. If you accept that Christ is living in me, and the presence of God is in me, and the presence of God is in you, that's all we need. Because God will sort out all our doctrines when we get upstairs. <laughs> God will sort up all our doctrines when we get upstairs. Doctrines aren't important. Now, why is it historic? Because in 1999, the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Lutheran Church signed an agreement that brought an end to the protest. This brought an end to the protest of Luther. Brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over. It's yours. In 1999, this was signed by the Lutheran Church, the Federation Worldwide. Later, about five years later, the Worldwide Methodists signed the same agreement. But as of today, we still have had no Protestant evangelical that will stand up and sign this agreement to agree with our brothers and sisters that we are saved by grace through faith to good works. And I believe that's something that needs to be fixed. There's a challenge for you. Maybe we now we're all Catholics again. <laughs> but we are reformed. We're Catholic in the universal sense. We are not protesting the doctrine of salvation by the Catholic Church anymore. We now preach the same gospel. We now preach you are saved by grace through faith. Alone, the word alone was the argument for 500 years. The word alone is there. You can read it yourself. The protest is over. The protest is over. So Tony Palmer then introduced a video recorded on his iPhone from Pope Francis to the convention. In the video, Pope Francis entreated the Pentecostal ministers at the convention to join him in a spiritual embrace. And this is what happened at the conclusion. Vi ringrazio tanto per sentirmi. Vi ringrazio tanto per lasciarmi parlare. Well, I don't want to play all of that. It's about eight minutes long. So he asked them to pray for him, and he would pray for them. And then they all got up and raised their hands, and, and Kenneth Copeland got up behind the podium and says, You heard the man? He asked us to pray for him. And so they all start praying and speaking in tongues. And then uh, Kenneth Copeland has Tony Palmer come up on the platform and take a video of the whole crowd um, basically praising the Pope and thanking the Pope and um, joining him yeah, in his quest. Following the minister's convention in June 2014, Kenneth Copeland and a delegation of Pentecostal leaders went to the Vatican and had dinner together. And the next day, Pope Francis spent three hours with the Pentecostals where they talked about unity. And after the trip to Rome, Kenneth Copeland had this to say. <laughs> the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification or being born again and the righteousness of God is a document created and agreed to by the Catholic Church's Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity and the Lutheran World Federation in 1999. As a result, a 
of extensive ecumenical dialogue. It states that the churches now share a common understanding of our justification by God's grace through faith in Christ. To the parties involved, this essentially resolves the conflict over the nature of justification which was at the root of the Protestant Reformation. The protest is over. So the Vatican has also been engaged in dialogues with the Orthodox churches. The Orthodox church split from the Catholic church over a thousand years ago. And the history between the Eastern and Western church has been full of bloodshed and intrigue. Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI were very much engaged in meetings with other religious groups. Pope Benedict was instrumental in a historic meeting at the Vatican with the Greek Orthodox Church in 2006. And there's an article in showing the Greek Orthodox in the Vatican there with the Pope. Dialogues continued with the Orthodox churches in February 2016, Pope Francis went to Cuba to meet with the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church. The leaders of the two churches met there and signed an agreement while they were there. And there's an article about that meeting with Patriarch Kirill. Pope Francis gave Patriarch Kirill a re reliquary with a relic of St. Cyril, in other words, a bone or something, uh, the patriarch's patron saint, and a chalice, which not only is signs of hope for full communion between the two churches, but also a sign that the Catholic Church recognizes the validity of the Orthodox sacraments. In April of 2017, Pope Francis went to Egypt and met with the leader of the Coptic Orthodox Church, where they also signed an agreement. And here's an article about that meeting. Uh, we today, Pope Francis and Pope Tadros II, in order to please the heart of the Lord Jesus, as well as that of our sons and daughters in the faith, mutually declare that we, with one mind and heart, will seek sincerely not to repeat the baptism that has been administered in either of our churches. So if you're baptized in Orthodox, you don't have to get rebaptized to be a Catholic and vice versa. And we will work towards a shared formulation of the Lord's Prayer and a common date for the celebration of Easter. And this has been a contention for their whole history. Um, the WCC General Secretary said, we are as churches called to be one so that the world may believe. Now, where do they get this from? John, John chapter 17, right? The Lord's last prayer. And um, there's a movement called the John 17 movement. And their goal is to bring all the Christians together so that we all might be one, so that the world might believe. So what they're saying is that Jesus' prayer has not been answered for 2,000 years. Jesus' prayer has gone unanswered for 2,000 years. Well, I have a problem with that. Okay? I believe Jesus' prayer was answered at Pentecost. Okay? And that everyone who joins themselves to Christ... Okay, and receives the Holy Spirit and is regenerated by the Holy Spirit is brought into unity with the Father and with the Son and consequently with one another. We're all brothers and sisters because of that unity which Jesus prayed for in John chapter 17. They want to help us come closer to full catholicity which is precisely the antidote to contemporary fragmentation and sectarianism. They want to make us all one. 
Leaders of all religions are seeking unity, and the last three popes have worked tirelessly to establish relationships with the leaders of all religions. Pope Francis has done more for ecumenism in the last several years than all his predecessors. The following are a few pictures that chronicle some of his ecumenical movements. And so, as we go through these pictures, you'll see him with uh, leaders of all different faiths and different denominations and him signing agreements This is an interesting one. It says, Pope Francis meets with religious, political, and cultural leaders from around the world, September 30th at the Vatican. The leaders were attending an annual dialogue. So this happens every year. Okay. On peace that began in 1986. Very interesting. This is at the 9-11 Memorial in New York City. In 2015. And they officially titled this a multi-religious gathering with Pope Francis. The Pope's always in the center of it. And everyone else is required to wear black, except for a few ladies, which we're going to talk about a little later. So I have no idea how this man had any time to write his encyclical. He spent his whole time running around the world and having meetings in the Vatican Library. So is that with the clothes, the Muslims and stuff too? Muslims, yeah. The Iraqis, uh, Israelites, uh, you name it, all of them. These are the Coptic Orthodox. These are the Islam leaders. And this is one of my favorite pictures. Do you notice the two serpents wound together? Pope Francis and several prominent evangelical and Pentecostal leaders met in Rome last Friday to discuss areas of mutual agreement and where they may respectfully disagree. The aim of the gathering, which had no official agenda, was to build unity between the Christian traditions that have historic enmity. So the Evangelical Lutherans overwhelmingly vote to approve Declaration of Unity with the Roman Catholics. They formally declared they are one with Rome. What would Martin Luther think? Mm -hmm. Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue praises Buddha and calls for a universal sol solidarity between Catholic Church and all religions. And then they send a message, which they do every year, for the Buddhist feast of Vesak, which is the birthday of Buddha. So they're celebrating Buddha's birthday. And then they praise Buddhism for the wisdom it teaches its young. T. Jakes, who just passed away not too long ago, also was working with the ecumenical movement. 
Now, this document is called the Directory for the Application of Principles and Norms of Ecumenism. It was released by the Vatican in 1993. And the Vatican has positioned itself as the supreme authority in the ecumenical movement and has written the manual on how ecumenism is to be properly advanced. You see, they hijacked the ecumenical movement of the Protestants, and now they're in charge. The following are quotes quite revealing. The search for Christian unity was one of the principal concerns of the Second Vatican Council. From the time of the Council onwards, fraternal relations with churches and ecclesial communities which are not in full communion with the Catholic Church have intensified. Theological dialogues have been set up and have increased in number. The Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity sees that the decrees of the Second Vatican Council which pertain to ecumenical matters are put into practice. It fosters, brings together, and coordinates national and international organizations promoting the unity of Christians and is watchful over the initiatives. Mm -hmm. It must proceed in close connection with the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Do you know what the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith is? It used to be called the Inquisition. Okay, they changed its name to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. So to, in order to maintain the purity of the faith, okay, they have to make sure that everything that's done in ecumenical lines is in harmony with their congregation of the doctrine of the faith. Okay. So have they changed their beliefs? Right in this book it says, Catholics hold the firm conviction that the one true church of Christ subsists in the Catholic church which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with him. They confess that the entirety of revealed truth of sacraments and of ministry that Christ gave for the building up of his church and the carrying out of its mission is found within the Catholic communion of the church. The Council affirms this unity, we believe, subsists in the Catholic Church as something she can never lose. And we hope that it will continue to increase until the end of time. This unity, which is of its very nature, requires full visible communion of all Christians, is the ultimate goal of the ecumenical movement. They just defined it. Full visible communion must be required of all Christians. It is implicit in the concern for this unity and this communion that Catholics should be concerned to deepen relations both with Eastern Christians and Christians in communities issuing from the Reformation. So we see that the movement that began with a few hundred Protestant missionaries wanting to work together has been hijacked by the Vatican and transformed into a worldwide force for the unification of all religions under the leadership of the papacy. What is the main goal of the ecumenical movement? Unity. Unity to what end? Power. There's power in numbers. Okay. Power to transform society using governmental power. Power over fundamentalist extremism. Fundamentalism, a form of religion, especially Islam or Protestant Christianity, that upholds belief in the strict, literal interpretation of Scripture. 
Do you believe in the strict literal interpretation of scripture? Amen. You're a fundamentalist. Amen. The enemy of religious unity is fundamentalism. Their kind of unity. Okay. Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? They want to walk together even though they're not agreed. Fundamentalists stand in the way of their quest for power. Satan's goal is to silence the fundamentalists, marginalize them, and ultimately eliminate them. The ecumenical movement doesn't need to overcome every obstacle to achieve its goal. They don't need to agree on every point of doctrine. Obviously, they never will. All they need to achieve is for each religious group to come to the place where they accept that what unites them is more important than what divides them, and that unity must be achieved at all cost. Fundamentalists that do not go along with the agenda of the Vatican are to be viewed as the enemy of society and religion. I'll let Pope Francis tell you. This is in September 13, 2015, <clears throat> shortly before he came to the United States. He said, our God is a God who is close, who accompanies. Fundamentalists keep God away from accompanying his people. They divert their minds from him and transform him into an ideology. So in the name of this ideological God, they kill, they attack, destroy, slander. Practically speaking, they transform that God into a Baal, an idol. Wow. Must have fun stuff up. No religion is immune from its own fundamentalisms. In every religion, there will be a small group of fundamentalists whose work is to destroy for the sake of an idea and not reality. And reality is superior to ideas. In the Catholic Church, we have some, many, who believe they possess the absolute truth. And they go on sullying others through slander and defamation. And this is wrong. Religious fundamentalism must be combated. It is not religious. God is lacking. It is idolatrous. We know that no religion is immune from forms of individual delusion or ideological extremism. This means that we must be especially attentive to every type of fundamentalism, whether religious or of any other kind. Do you know where he said this? He said it in the Congress of the United States government before both all the representatives and all the senators. A fundamentalist group, although it may not kill anyone, although it may not strike anyone, is violent. The mental structure of fundamentalists is violence in the name of God. So we're a fundamentalist organization. That's what Bill Gates is saying. Same thing Bill Gates is saying. So are you a fundamentalist? Yes, I'm While many modern Christian fundamentalists have adopted unbiblical doctrines that we do not share, such as futurism, the secret rapture, etc., the belief in the inerrancy of the Bible is the true definition of a fundamentalist. And it is fidelity to the word of God that the Vatican cannot tolerate. <laughs> so fundamentalist belief number one, the inerrancy of the Bible. We believe the Bible contains absolute truth. Belief number two, the literal nature of the biblical accounts, especially regarding Christ's miracles, the creation account in Genesis, and the subsequent worldwide flood. If you believe that, you're a fundamentalist. The virgin birth of Christ, the bodily resurrection and physical return of Christ, 
the substitutionary atonement of Christ on the cross once for all. So are you an extremist? Extremism, the holding of extreme political or religious views, fanaticism. This is in U.S. Today, October 14th, 2015. Now, you notice these dates, September, October, December, okay, 2015, right? Justice Department announces a new post to combat extremists. The Assistant Attorney General John Carlin said, no single ideology governs hate and extremism. Sounds like he's quoting the Pope, doesn't he? Carlin said, nevertheless, we see commonalities among those who wish to do us harm. This gives us important information as we shape our deterrence and disruption strategies. One of these uh, commonalities, according to this 2009 report by Homeland Security, is the emphasis of end time prophecies. And this is a right wing it's extremism, current economical and political climate fueling resurgence in radicalization and recruitment. Fundamentalists are being lumped together with terrorists and laws are being enacted worldwide to suppress the hate speech of fundamentalists. An image of the intolerance of the Roman Catholic Church is being formed throughout the world and the United States is leading the movement. There are three enemies at the end of time, enemies of Christ, enemies of the gospel, enemies of his people that we need to keep an eye on. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. So the dragon is spiritualism in all its forms. The beast is the Vatican controlling the nations of the earth and the false prophet uh, are the apostate Protestants in the United States who have spread the false prophecies of futurism throughout the world. And we're witnessing the uniting of these three in the ecumenical movement. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. You remember our first verse out of Matthew, where he told the angels to gather together the tares, and bind them in bundles. And so we have a gathering together in Revelation of these ten kings with the beast of the earth and with their army. They're being gathered together. So the church and the state are uniting. Protestants have been seeking political power for decades, and the Catholics, through their various orders, have infiltrated all levels of politics. Most of the top positions in the federal government are occupied by Catholics or those trained in their institutions. And here are some of the pictures to illustrate how the papacy has been courting the favor and power of the political leaders of the world. This is Adolf Hitler with uh, papal nuncio, that means ambassador, uh, Archbishop Cesare or whatever his name is, at a New Year's reception in 1935. And it says here that uh, the church controlled center party was instrumental in giving Hitler dictatorial power over Germany. It was a church controlled party that gave Hitler the power in Germany. Uh, this is President Dwight D. Eisenhower bowing before John Paul XXIII at the Vatican. Uh, the popes were not allowed to come to the White House at this point, 1959. Uh, it's only the second time that an American president has met publicly with the Supreme Pontiff of the Catholic Church. 
Uh, John F. Kennedy publicly denied any allegiance to the Pope during his presidential campaign and declined to kiss the Pope Paul VI ring during their meeting. Then we have, uh, of course, the assassination of John Kennedy, followed by his replacement. Um, he could not go to the White House, so they met at the... Uh, Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York. And then, two years later, he goes to the Vatican. And this is Richard Nixon in 1970 at the Vatican. Now, you notice how his wife is dressed in black with a black veil over her head, right? This is protocol. Uh, the protocol for papal audiences requires women to wear a long black garment with long sleeves and a black veil, the color of which ostensibly signifies the virtues of piety and humility. The queens of Italy, Belgium, and Spain were exempt from this rule. Now, why were they exempt? They were exempt because those were Catholic countries. That's why they gave them the exemption. Okay as were the Grand Duchess of Luxembourg and the Princess of the House of Savoy. This privilege is called privilege de blanc, which means the privilege of the white. Those who are at present permitted to wear white garments include the Queens of Spain, Belgium, and Italy, the Grand Duchess of Luxembourg, the Princess of Monaco, and the Princess of the House of Savoy. In summary, those royal houses whose regents had been given the title Most Catholic Majesty. So continuing on, we have Richard Nixon, Vatican Library, uh, Gerald Ford, Vatican Library, uh, Jimmy Carter, Joe, John Paul II. Did they change the rules for letting them enter the White House? Uh, yes, they did. So here, here you have Nancy and Ronald Reagan with Pope John Paul II. Now, Ronald Reagan conferred with Billy Graham about sending an ambassador to the Vatican, as the United States had not sent an ambassador to the Vatican or received one from the Vatican. And so he asked Billy Graham, and Billy Graham went to the evangelical leaders and asked them, hey, what would you think if Ronald Reagan sent an ambassador to the Vatican? They said, oh, yeah, we don't care. So he came back and told Ronald Reagan, they don't care. And so he appointed the first ambassador to the Vatican in 1984. So here's George Bush Sr., now, this is a very interesting picture. Yasser Arafat. Yasser Arafat kissing the Pope's ring. Now, kissing the ring is a gesture of subservience. Why does an Arab pay homage to the Pope? And here he is kissing the Quran. Why does the supposed head of the Christian church kiss the Quran, which advocates killing all Christians and inf infidels to Islam? This is crazy. These are some of the verses in the Quran, which say they are to make war with us continually, perpetually. Why would he kiss that book? Yeah, here's Bill Clinton receiving Catholic communion in Africa. Now, he was supposedly a Baptist. You're not supposed to receive communion unless you're a Catholic. Okay, this incident created quite a controversy in the days following. So here is uh, Pope John Paul II and George W. Bush, shortly after his inauguration, sitting underneath a painting of Ignatius Loyola receiving his commission to establish the Jesuits. Here's George and Laura Bush receiving the mass, and George is making the sign of the skull and bone. 
And what that signifies is as a corpse, they will not question any command that's given to them by their superiors. This, this is an interesting quote. Mr. President, final question. Uh, the president says, yes, sir. You said famously when you looked into Vladimir Putin's eyes that you saw his soul. Uh -huh. the president said, yes. What do you see when you look in Benedict XVI's eyes? What do you see? And he said, God. So we have all the presidents paying homage, bowing to the beast. Now here you have three presidents, George W. Bush, George Bush and Bill Clinton, as well as Condoleezza Rice and others all kneeling before the body of the Pope. That's a strange picture at the funeral there. Pope Benedict the 16th. He's healthy. That guy's in good shape. He's in healthy. So all the kings of the earth all have to come and pay homage to the Pope. So Ratzinger resigns and Pope Francis takes over. Different pope, same agenda. Oh my. The same with the president. Different president, same agenda. Church and state's not happening, is it? He's a busy guy, isn't he? Well, he's got to get the whole world together on one page. Yeah. not going to work. For a little while. Mm -hmm. He'll go for a little bit. <coughs> yeah. For a little, for a little yeah. while. Not for us. I mean, I'm not going to go along with it, but the world is. The world is going along with it right mm -hmm. now. Yep. It's been happening. And it doesn't matter if you're... Protestant, Catholic, Muslim, Hindu, French, English, Chinese, some African tribe, Brazilian. Oh, there's Mr. Trump. And then there's the Trump. They all have to sit across from his table like they're the pupil and he's the teacher. So they've called him the spiritual leader of the world, the political leader of the world, the peace broker, the savior of the environment, the person of the year, and Nobel Peace Prize nominee. And everywhere he goes, millions of people come out. This is in Korea. And the youth seem to love him. So then he turns to the role of peace broker and brings the Israelis and the air and he goes to Cuba and he negotiates the resumption of relations between the United States and Cuba. Then he releases an encyclical which addresses climate change and now the world sees him as the leader in the movement to save the planet. Okay. Yeah. The savior, most interesting man in the world, best dressed man of 2013, holy reformer. <laughs> National Geographic, <laughs> the Rolling Stone. Oh my. Time Magazine, New World Pope. Oh my. I'm losing my appetite. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. 
I was Paul anyway. Person of the Year, Pope Francis, Time Magazine. If a man is person is gay and seeks the Lord and is of good will, who am I to judge him? This uh, painting sold for a million dollars on eBay. That'd be nice to have that kind of money. That's Pope Benedict at the United Nations. This is Pope Francis when he came to the United States speaking at the White House. And of course, he's facing the obelisk. <laughs> and then he addresses a joint session of Congress the next day. And then he addresses the United Nations the next day. And then he goes to Philadelphia where our constitution was signed the next day. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. The monstrance. He's carrying that around on purpose? Sure. Yeah, it's what they do in the mass. They take the host, which is the little round wafer, and they put it inside the monstrance. And it signifies... It really goes back to Isis and Osiris and goes way back to there. Oh my. <laughs> so here you have Pope Francis kissing a baby idol and always on the knee. Here's another crucifix. Mm -hmm. And where is he kissing him? Mm -hmm. On the knee. What did they do on the cross to those that were hanging on the cross? But he doesn't kiss Mother Mary. This is a symbol of Mother Mary on the knee. And there's Jesus hanging on the bent cross. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. The following are quotes from the Great Controversy. Romanism is now regarded by Protestants with far greater favor than in former years. In those countries where Catholicism is not in the ascendancy, and the Papists are taking a conciliatory course in order to gain influence, there is an increasing indifference concerning the doctrines that separate the Reformed churches from the papal hierarchy. The opinion is gaming ground that, after all, we do not differ so widely upon vital points as has been supposed, and that a little concession on our part will bring us into a better understanding with Rome. The time was when Protestants placed a high value upon the liberty of conscience which had been so dearly purchased. They taught their children to abhor popery and held that to seek harmony with Rome would be disloyalty to God. But how widely different are the sentiments now expressed? The defenders of the papacy declare that the church has been maligned and the Protestant world are inclined to accept the statement. Many urge that it is unjust to judge the church of today by the abominations and absurdities that marked her reign during the centuries of ignorance and darkness. They excuse her horrible cruelty as the result of the barbarism of the times, and they plead that the influence of modern civilization has changed her sentiments. The Constitution of the United States guarantees liberty of conscience. Nothing is dearer or more fundamental. Pope Pius IX, in his encyclical letter of August 15, 1854, said, The absurd and erroneous doctrines or ravings in defense of liberty of conscience are a most pestilential error, a pest of all others most to be dreaded in a state. 
The same Pope, in his encyclical letter of December 8, 1864, anathematized those who assert the liberty of conscience and of religious worship. Also, all such as maintain that the church may not employ force. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. As spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of the day, it has greater power to deceive and ensnare. Satan himself is converted after the modern order of things. He will appear in the character of an angel of light. Through the agency of spiritualism, Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and many undeniable wonders will be performed. And as the spirits will profess faith in the Bible and manifest respect for the institutions of the church, their work will be accepted as a manifestation of divine power. The line of distinction between professed Christians and the ungodly is now hardly distinguishable. Church members love what the world loves and are ready to join with them. And Satan determines to unite them in one body and thus strengthen his cause by sweeping all into the ranks of spiritualism. Papists who boast of miracles as a certain sign of the true church will be readily deceived by this wonder-working power. And Protestants, having cast away the shield of truth, will also be deluded. Papists, Protestants, and worldlings will alike accept the form of godliness without the power. And they will see in this union a grand movement for the conversion of the world and the ushering in of the long-expected millennium. God's word is given warning of the impending danger. Let this be unheeded and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome are really are. And the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are only when it is too late to escape the snare. She is silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in legislative halls, in the churches, and in the hearts of men. She is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the recesses. She is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. Stealthily and unsuspectedly, she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to strike. All that she desires is vantage ground, and this is already being given her. We shall soon see and shall feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur reproach and persecution. That's from the Great Controversy, pages 581 through pages 589. Wow.